please arise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto thee all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended thee, and justly deserve thy temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray thee of thy boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto you, and in the stead, and by the command of my Lord, Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Hallelujah. When thou said, Seek, my fa Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face from me. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Take it. 
takest away the sin of the world. Receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. The Old Testament lesson appointed for reading on Exaude is recorded for us in the prophecy given through St. Ezekiel, chapter 36, verses 25 through 27. The Lord spoke through Ezekiel, saying, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Here ends the lesson. We read responsively Psalm 97 as printed in the bulletin. The Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. Let the Clouds and darkness surround him. A fire goes before him. His lightnings light the world. The mountains melt like wax at the presence of the Lord. The heavens declare his righteousness. And all people see his glory. Let all be put to shame who serve carved images, who boast of idols. Worship him, all you gods. The Zion hears and is glad. And the gods of Judah rejoice because of your judgment. For you, Lord, are most high above all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. You who love the Lord hate evil. He preserves the souls of his saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous. And gladness for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous. And give thanks and remembrance of his holy name. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be world without end. Amen. The Holy Epistle appointed for this day is recorded for us in the first letter of St. Peter, chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. Brethren, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. 
Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God reigneth over the heathen. God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. Hallelujah. I will not leave you comfortless. I go, and I will come again to you, and your heart shall rejoice. Hallelujah. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel, recorded for us in the Gospel according to St. John, beginning in chapter 15 at the 26th verse. Jesus taught his disciples, saying, When the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. He will testify of me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. These things I have spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues, yes. The time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you, that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning, because I was with you. Here ends the Holy Gospel.
and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten of not being, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeded from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. fellow redeemed by the blood of the spotless Lamb of God, of whom the Holy Spirit testifies. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The words on which we meditate this morning are the words of the gospel lesson that you have just heard. Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. It's kind of an uneasy Sunday in the church here, frankly. 
We've just been going Sunday after Sunday filled with great joy because of the resurrection. And next Sunday, we're going to celebrate the giving of the outward gifts of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. And what a joyful Sunday. And Trinity Sunday, the God who is three persons and all of those three persons working together. The God who loves us, who is the definition of love itself. Oh, what joy. Christmas, what joy. Reformation, what joy. But this Sunday has that on edge sort of feeling. It's a Sunday of patience. It's a Sunday of reflection. So the ancient Greek philosophers suggested that if you are living your life and you are not thinking about what you are doing and why and what the consequences of your behavior might be, well, Socrates said such a life is not even worth living. We're human beings. We're better than the animals. We think about what we are about. We think about what we are doing and why. We think about the meaning of life and choose the better path. Or do we? Really? Are we better than animals that simply act on instinct? Simply think about the immediate reward, about what is most expedient now and what I want now and not looking towards something better. The Old Testament lesson is interesting. God speaking to people such as us who make idols of our toys, make idols of pleasure, make idols of our own opinions about ourselves and the world around us. And he says, I will sprinkle you with clean water and you will be clean. And he does that in the waters of holy baptism. He says to people like us, you, you have a heart of stone. I tried to plant the seed of my word into your hearts, and it bounces off like it's bouncing off of stones. And you're about that smart. But I'm going to take that heart of stone out of you. And I'm going to replace it with a heart of flesh that will receive my word, where my word can grow and take root and bring forth fruit. And in the divine service, we are told to lift up our hearts. And we respond, we lift them up unto the Lord, that he might take away our hearts of stone. So in the small catechism in the back, there are these 20 questions. And the last question is, what if a person does not feel a hunger and thirst for that sacrament where we lift up our hearts and God takes away that rock and gives us a heart of flesh, the heart of his own son in its place. What if we don't feel a longing and a thirst for it? Because the reality is, yeah, sometimes church is boring. And rather than reading the Bible, I'd rather click with my thumbs and view with my eyes things that just, you know, don't require much thought, don't require self-evaluation, things that are immediately interesting, but, you know, what if I don't feel any hunger or thirst? The best advice, Dr. Luther said, was that such a person, in other words, you and I, should put our hand to our heart and check if we're still alive that we have flesh and blood, that a heart that is beating inside of us, and then hear what the scriptures say about our condition and about the temptations of the devil, the world, and the flesh, and how the devil will not give us any peace. The problem is we're sleeping. We're sleeping. We need to wake up. We need to understand that we can choose the better thing. We do not have to be dragged along with evil and do whatever. We can choose to do what is good. 
And when we do something and we say, well, I do it because I like it, and the Bible says, yeah, but it's harmful to you. Yes, but I like it. We can choose not to like it on the basis of knowing that it is not good for us, spiritually speaking, not good for our salvation, not good for the salvation of the people around us. We can lift up the heart of stone that the Lord may take it from us and give us a heart of flesh. We can do that. We can choose the good and refuse the bad based on what God says about it. But that brings us to what the Holy Spirit is all about. Jesus said, I will send that comforter, the Holy Spirit, the helper in our translation as we have it in our translation that we officially use here for public reading. When he comes, that spirit of truth Pilate said, what is truth? The people of our day say, well, that's true for you, but that's not true for me. No, no. There is truth. And the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And we are told in the scriptures that if we will not receive a love of the truth, just think of what God is saying. A love of the truth. God is not even saying that you must exactly know the truth, but that you will long for it, that you will love it, that you will respect the truth. If you will not have that much, which one could argue is the absolute most basic line, that you would love the truth. If you will not love the truth, God is going to give you over. He's going to say, run your way. He's going to let go of your leash and let you run. And he will give to you a very strong delusion so that you will believe, and as the scriptures say it, not so much that you will believe lies, but that you will believe the lie. And when you go away from here today, you can contemplate what the lie might be referring to. False teachers come with all sorts of deceptions. And the first thing that they want to do is they want to connect with your ego because if they can connect with your ego, they've got you snared. They've got you hooked. And they will reel you in. But the spirit of the truth comes to us and says, here, look at what God says about you. You are not as good as you think you are. And God is not something you conjure up in your mind, but he reveals himself in his holy scriptures. And he has revealed himself most clearly in the person of his son, God who became man, our Lord Jesus Christ, the only savior of mankind. There we see what God is like. There we see what love truly is, what selflessness truly is. And so it is that we never really focus on the Holy Spirit that much because the Holy Spirit does not witness to himself. Interestingly enough, the Holy Spirit does not really witness directly to God the Father. Listen to the beginning of our text once again. When the Helper comes, whom I, that is Jesus, shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. By the way, do you recognize words from the creeds? He, that is the Holy Spirit, will testify of me, of Jesus. The Holy Spirit testifies about Jesus because God the Father does not desire for you and I to know him directly, but he reveals himself in his son, whom he calls the name of God, whom he calls the face of God, the presence of God, etc. So the Father wants to be known in his son Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is not so much concerned that you know him as such, but he is concerned that you know Jesus. So everything 
in Christian worship. Everything about the life of the Christian is centered in Jesus. Without Jesus, there is effectively nothing for us. If we cannot love Jesus, the Son of God, in whom the Father is revealed, to whom the Holy Spirit is pointing, then there's no point to anything. We don't actually have the Father or the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is never drawing attention to himself or to the gifts that he gives. And as our text goes on, so the Spirit of truth will testify of Jesus, the Son of God. And then Jesus said to the ones he would call apostles, sent out ones, you too will be my martyrs. Or are you more comfortable with the word witness? You too will be my witnesses. You too will testify not of yourselves, not of the Holy Spirit, but you will testify of me. And so it is that that outpouring that came on Pentecost that we're going to celebrate next week came to a crashing end. And St. Paul says so in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where he says, if there is this gift or that gift or whatever, these things will end. These things will cease. They're never going to start again. They come to an end. But there are three gifts of the Spirit that remain. And it's interesting that on Pentecost, we are not focused on the charismatic gifts. We are focused on the ability to determine truth from error. But we'll talk about that next week. But that's the focus of Pentecost. Leading up to Pentecost, we talk about the work of the Holy Spirit and the person of the Holy Spirit and all that sort of thing. And he is a witness to Christ. And those gifts that he poured out to and through the apostles ended when the apostles died because they were there to show that these men are the approved ones. And we don't need it today. We don't. Because their words have been written down. Not everything Jesus said or did, not everything the apostles said or did, but what we need to know, even as John at the end of his gospel says, you know, there's so many things Jesus did, but these things are not passed on by word of mouth. These things are written so that you may know that Jesus is the Christ and have life in him. So, when the apostles were speaking by mouth, these charismatic gifts were given so that the people could know by supernatural proofs that these were the ones. And when it began to be written down, and passed around the people who had personally heard the apostles speak and received charismatic gifts, not fake ones or ones that you can fake, but ones that were provably and obviously true. They read and they said, you know what? This is the word of the apostles. And they gave their approval to it. And when the apostles died, those outward signs were no longer passed out to people. Those who had them, had them, and when they died, they were gone. They're gone, except for three. They're gone. Why? Because it's written now, and we have the witness of the church. And the idea that it was written sometime after the church, after the apostles had been preaching, is very important for us. This is what gives us certainty about the scriptures that we have received. Because those who personally heard the apostles felt their touch. They laid hands on them. They read it, and they said, yes, this is the real thing. We have the scriptures. We have certainty. We don't have to worry about, is this true or that true? We know where the truth is. And so now for us, the spirit of truth gives us the ability to determine truth from error, to understand what is correct and false, what is right and what is wrong. And those three gifts of the spirit that remain are simply faith, hope, and love, as we talked about the last couple of weeks. Faith, hope, and love. And so the apostles were called to be martyrs. 
Wait a minute, they were called to be witnesses. That's what martyr means. Martyr means witness. So if you go all the way back to Christmas, after Christmas there are three martyrs' days. The Holy Innocents, John the Evangelist, and Stephen. Stephen was a martyr in will and in deed. He was willing to give his life for Christ. And he was called upon to give it. And he did. John the Evangelist was a martyr in will. He said, I am willing. And Jesus acknowledged John was indeed willing. And in some ways, John's slow martyrdom by living out to old age and dying a natural death is so much more dangerous, so much harder, day after day, when you go through the difficult persecutions, the severe ones, and the soft persecutions like you and I largely go through. Really hard to keep the faith. And then there were the holy innocents, the little baby boys that were living around Bethlehem and in Bethlehem when Jesus was born, that Herod murdered little baby boys who were born to the faithful, who were being raised in the faith, who were never asked, are you willing? But God required their blood as a witness to our Savior Jesus. When Jesus ascended into heaven, he said to the apostles, not to you and me, to the apostles, go and make disciples by sprinkling clean water on them, the waters of baptism, that holy water that makes us holy, not that the water is holy, but when it is used according to God's command and connected to his promises, it is indeed holy and it makes you holy. Baptizing and teaching them everything that I have commanded you, do this in remembrance of me, Jesus said. He sent those men out giving them the command. And he worked through miraculous signs with them confirming the word. But he said something interesting. I am with you all, always. I am with y'all always, even to the very end of the age. We know from those words that while Jesus spoke directly to his apostles, and there are certain things that apply really only to them, and we see that in the scriptures and in the history of the Acts of the Apostles, yet the command carries on to our day. You and I are to be martyrs for Christ, witnesses if you prefer. But if we use the word martyr, then when things are difficult, then when we are rejected, then when there are those who kill us because we are Christians and they believe that they are doing a service to God, then it all makes sense if we disconnect ourselves from the reality that we are called upon to give up our white-knuckled grasp on our lives and what we call our destiny and what we think God's plan for our life is as if we can know anything much beyond he calls us to repentance and promises us heaven and that we're going to suffer in this life. If we can let go of that white-knuckled grip on our lives, we become so much more useful to Jesus we grow so much more in faith, hope, and love. And it actually becomes so much easier for us. And while I started out pointing out how you and I are a bunch of idolaters with hearts of stone, yet by God's grace you are here. Yet by God's grace you have been sprinkled with the clean water, and in God's eyes are indeed clean. By God's grace, you hold up your heart of stone, recognizing 
that what God says about you remains true. And he takes from you that heart of stone and replaces it with the heart of his son, Jesus. There, the word of God grows within us. And we are his martyrs. We are his witnesses. We continue to point out that there is a better way. There is a more certain thing. There is a reality that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And that that doesn't need to be scary. That anything that you think God is taking away from you when you come to faith in Christ, he gives back to you a hundred times over. And you begin to see it now in this life already when you live as a Christian, trusting in the only true God. And when you get to heaven, you won't even think about anything you might be thinking you're giving up here. The pleasures will be beyond, be beyond your wildest imagination, and they will be pure and good pleasures, not the sort of thing that we give from, get from the devil and the world where it scratches an itch and we immediately itch somewhere else or in the exact same spot because it can never, never, ever satisfy, but always leaves us empty, always disappoints. No, the joys that we have in Christ are so much better. They are the real thing. And so you too are Jesus' witnesses, along with the apostles and along with the Holy Spirit. And so we pray, as we prayed today, Almighty and everlasting God, make us to always have a devout will toward thee and to serve thy majesty with a pure heart through Jesus Christ. We can't do it without him. But then again, his resurrection is our resurrection. Not that we're going to remain in the graves, but he, our head, has risen. And because he has risen, we will rise. Even as we talked about at Christmas, unto you, not unto Mary, but unto you, a child is born. Christ is for all of us. So his resurrection was not for him alone. But his resurrection belongs to each and every one of us. And in the waters of baptism, we have already risen from the most difficult kind of death there is to fix. Spiritual death. Death in trespasses and sins. And our bodies will then rise too. Christ is risen. risen Hallelujah. Amen. Please arise for the blessing. And now the peace of God, which goes beyond all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Our offertory hymn today is hymn 223.
Almighty and everlasting God, who art worthy to be had in reverence by all the children of men, we give thee most humble and hearty thanks for the innumerable blessings, both temporal and spiritual, which, without any merit or worthiness on our part, thou hast bestowed upon us. We praise thee, especially that thou hast preserved unto us, in their purity, thy saving word and the sacred ordinances of thy house. And we beseech thee, O Lord, to preserve and extend thy kingdom of grace and to grant unto thy holy church throughout the world purity of doctrine and faithful pastors who shall preach thy word with power and help all who hear rightly to understand and truly to believe it. Send forth laborers into thy harvest and open the door of faith unto all the heathen and unto the people of Israel. In mercy, remember the enemies of thy church and grant unto them repentance unto life. Be thou the protector and defender of thy people in all time of tribulation and danger. And may we, in communion with thy church and in brotherly unity with all our fellow Christians, fight the good fight of faith and in the end receive the salvation of our souls. Bestow thy grace upon all the nations of the earth. Especially do we entreat thee to bless our land and all its inhabitants and all who are in authority. Cause thy glory to dwell among us, and let mercy and truth, righteousness and peace everywhere prevail. To this end, we commend to thy care all our schools, and pray thee to make them nurseries of useful knowledge and Christian virtues, that they may bring forth the wholesome fruits of life. Graciously defend us from all calamities by fire and water, war and pestilence, scarcity and famine, Protect and prosper everyone in his appropriate calling, and cause all useful arts to flourish among us. Be thou the God and father of the widow and the fatherless children, the helper of the sick and the needy, and the comforter of the forsaken and distressed. Accept, we beseech thee, our bodies and souls, our hearts and minds, our talents and powers together with the offerings we bring before thee, which is our reasonable service. Heavenly Father, we have many of our loved ones, members of our own congregation, who are sick and suffering in many different ways. We pray that you would continue to look in mercy upon them. Where there is memory loss, remember them. Where there is frustration, grant them peace in the salvation that belongs to them and the knowledge that you do love them in our Savior Jesus. Grant patience to all to bear up under the present crosses they are under, and that you would keep all of our loved ones who are not able to gather with us, as well as us, in the true faith unto eternal life. And as we are strangers and pilgrims on earth, help us by true faith and a godly life to prepare for the world to come, doing the work thou hast given us to do while it is day, before the night cometh when no man can work. And when our last hour shall come, support us by thy power and receive us into thine everlasting kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who after his resurrection appeared openly to all his disciples and in their sight was taken up into heaven, that he might make us partakers of his divine nature. Therefore with angels and archangels 
and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying,
thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. We give thanks to thee, almighty God, that thou hast refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we beseech thee that of thy mercy thou wouldst strengthen us through the same, in faith towards thee and in fervent love toward one another, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be great.